the choice is mine, I must disappoint you. I do not see my function here this morning as that of a gladiator, a bullfighter, a gunfighter, or any other kind of fighter, nor as a dualist. I come as a scholar to an organization of professional concern to all of us. A second point, I do not regard the serious matter which we are here to discuss as any one of the many problems and conflicts which at present beset the Middle East. Iraq, Iran, Arab, Israel, fundamentalist, secularist, or the like. And there are ample other fora on which these can be discussed and, inshallah, solved. And perhaps more important, I think we all know that nothing that we say or do here this morning is going to have the slightest effect in the Middle East. We can change nothing. We can't even change each other's opinions, as we know from long experience. What we can and should discuss is ourselves, our own role, our own duty as scholars, our duty towards our discipline, towards our colleagues, towards our students, towards the media, and beyond the media, towards the general public. That is something which concerns us directly and where what we discuss, what we decide, can indeed should determine how we conduct ourselves in our professional avocations. Our duty being communicate what we have understood to others. In principle, of course, this problem, this duty, would be the same whatever the third term might be in the sequence, the scholar, the media, and the Middle East. In principle, it should be the same whether we substitute the Far East or for the Middle East, the Far West or the Middle West or India or any other part of the world, in principle. In fact, of course, we all know that it is different. And the Middle East in particular is different for two reasons which, may be mentioned, which I may mention here. One is that it's our region. It's the one with which we are concerned, all of us professionally, many of us personally, in a variety of ways. And there is another reason, which I think is in a way more important and also rather difficult, and that is that the Middle East, as an area of study for scholars in the Western world, presents peculiar problems different from those of most other areas. It is different from the situation in which we study a part of our own society. And that, I think, is self-evident. It is also different from a totally alien society, at least in its earlier history, its form of civilization. The Middle East is not like, say, India or China, which dawned at a fairly late date on the Western horizon, and concerning which we have no important prejudgments, no inherited traditional attitudes or stereotypes, nor, I hasten to add, because this is important, nor they of us. The connection between the Western world, which for this purpose extends from California to the Soviet Union inclusive, <clears throat> relations between the Western world and the Islamic world go back to the very beginnings of Islam and have been shaped by a whole series of events and more particularly by the seesaw conflict between the two worlds over 14 centuries. This Similarity in some respects, difference in others, makes it tempting and dangerously easy to go astray. We are dealing with a society in many ways akin to our own, quite beyond, quite apart from the general humanity which we all share. There are historical and cultural affinities, genuine affinities between the Middle East and the Western world, genuine affinities which can easily give rise to false analogies. Um, a simple example, we may try to explain things to those who are not familiar with Islam by saying the Quran is the Muslim Bible, Friday is the Muslim Sabbath. You must have heard these statements often enough. Up to a certain level, at a rather superficial level of discourse, these statements are accurate and informative. But as soon as we pursue them a little further, they become dangerously misleading. Because the Muslim approach to scripture is different from the Jewish or the Christian approach to scripture, as you can satisfy yourselves immediately by simply reversing the propositions. 
The Torah is the Jewish Quran, the Gospel is the Christian Quran. Doesn't make sense, does it? Nor does the other, really. In the same way, to take a more contemporary, <clears throat> more complex example, when we use such words as revolution, they have a different resonance in Islamic society against the background of Islamic history and tradition from that which they have in the West. In the Western world, the associations of the term revolution are the major revolutions of modern history, the American, the French, the Russian. In the Islamic world, there is a quite different revolutionary tradition, nurtured on different scriptures and classics, alluding to different history. And what matters, the evocative symbol is not the storming of the Bastille, but the Battle of Karbala and other events of that time. And in order to understand, in order to seek to understand movements in another civilization, we must try to understand it in its own terms, in relation to its own history, to its own traditions, and its own aspirations. The <clears throat> result of this situation is often that we resort on both sides to stereotypes, to stereotyped images and explanations. Um, in the course of the centuries-long confrontation, certain traditional attitudes have evolved on both sides. Among Western visitors to the Middle East for many, many centuries now, two stereotypes predominate. The one political, that of arbitrary despotism, uh, the other, shall we say, personal, that of unbridled sexual power. And the one relating <coughs> to the Sultan's palace, <coughs> the other to the women's quarters of that palace. And we have a, oh, thank you. We have a whole series of descriptions. Thanks. The presenting Middle Eastern government, Islamic government, Ottoman government, whatever we choose to call it, in terms of arbitrary, limitless, irresponsible autocracy. In the same way, Western travelers love to dwell in immense detail on what goes on inside the harem, about which they certainly knew nothing, and one can see them drooling visibly in their largely imaginary descriptions. Um, and this kind of thing is, of course, bilateral. Um, while Western travelers to the East speak of licentious men, Islamic travelers to the West usually speak of lascivious women. Um, they were, for the most part, shocked. And one wonders why, if the encounter of East and West it was really a meeting of licentious men and loose women, why they didn't get on better. <laughs> the answer to a stereotype is not, of course, a negative stereotype. Um, you do not refute the myth of unbridled autocracy by claiming that what existed was perfect democracy. You do not refute the myth of This total subjugation of women by insisting that women had rights far beyond those claimed by NOW. What are we to do? I see that I have one minute left. And what I shall offer is some general principles of how I feel a scholar ought to behave. You will probably say, yes, that's apple pie. Um, to which I would answer, maybe, but don't forget we are living in a time when apple pie is under attack when we are told that since perfect apple pie is impossible, we should eat raw dough and crab apples. Um, I don't share that opinion. I feel that such values as civility, trying to maintain a decent level of debate, to cool rather than to heat passions, to persuade rather than to shout down an opponent, are values worth preserving and one which we, as professional scholars in particular, owe to the society which employs us. Um, I indecently shout you down. <laughs> I apologize for interrupting before he <coughs> you finish, Professor Lewis, but if I'm to observe the rules, <laughs> this is the necess necessity. Uh, Professor Said. 
There is, a, there is, of course, a fairly wide spectrum of scholarly work that's being done on the Middle East, and of course the MISA convention program is evidence enough of this. Yet scholarly work in this, as in all other fields, is limited by contemporary social, political, economic, that is, contextual actualities. No scholar ever feels that his or her work is well known enough, and nearly every one of us believes that public tastes and what is easily accessible for those tastes miss the importance of a given area of knowledge. There is no abstract knowledge. All of it is situated relative to other scholarship, to the realities of distribution and circulation, to the social institutions, rhetorical traditions, methodological procedures of the field, as well as to the political interests and the facts of power and dominance in a given society at given periods. To speak about scholars, media, and the Middle East here and now is to speak first of the contemporary United States. And in the United States, it's also to distinguish first between the mainstream print and broadcast media and the fringe left and right wing press. Second, it is to distinguish between scholarly work on the Middle East that effectively remains secluded within the various specialist publications and those views and images of the Middle East in wide public circulation where they are either confirmed or refined and repudiated by scholarly experts. Roughly speaking, there are a small handful of essential thematic clusters in today's media coverage of the Middle East. One, the pervasive presence of generally Middle Eastern, more particularly Arab or Islamic terrorism, Arab or Islamic terrorist states and groups, as well as a terrorist network comprising Arab and Islamic groups and states backed by the Soviet Union, Cuba, and Nicaragua. Terrorism here is most often characterized as congenital, not as having any foundation in grievances, prior violence, or continuing conflicts. Two, the rise of Islamic and Muslim fundamentalism, usually but not always Shia, associated with such names as Khomeini, Qazafi, Hezbollah, as well as to coin a phrase, the return of Islam. Three, the Middle East is a place whose violent and incomprehensible events are routinely referred back to a distant past full of ancient, tribal, religious, or ethnic hatreds. Four, the Middle East is a contested site in which our side is represented by the civilized and democratic West, the United States, and Israel. Five, the Middle East is the locale for the reemergence of a virulent quasi-European, i.e. Nazi, type of anti-Semitism. Six, the Middle East is the Fonz et Origo, the hatching ground of the gratuitous evils of the PLO. Yasser Arafat, whose poor media image is probably beyond repair, is the ranking figure in this cluster of motifs, whose basic message is that if they exist at all, the Palestinians are both marginal and entirely to blame for their misfortunes. Now, as it happens, these motifs coincide almost perfectly with current US policy. And as a superpower with by far the most interventionary force in the Middle East in money, arms, and political influence, we can safely characterize the United States, therefore, as being abetted in its and its policies by its media. How far this situation contradicts the rhetorical proclamations of a free, non-propagandistic press, I shall leave to your sense of charity. But that the picture of the contemporary and even the historical Middle East is misrepresented tendentiously, I shall not leave to your charity, I shall say it myself. It is a deeply flawed, deeply antagonistic, deeply uninformed and uninforming view that regulates what is covered and what is not covered. But to a considerable degree, it has worked, and this is the shameful part, because of the active collaboration of a whole cadre of scholars, experts, and abettors drawn from the ranks of the Orientalist and special interest lobbies, among whom one, the Zionist lobby, has garnered a vastly disproportionate strength, given that Israel in the Middle East contains only four million inhabitants. Thus, in every one of the six constellations I have identified, there has been a major role played in formulating and affirming the circulation of this reductive material by members of a profession and its friends who do know better, but who do know what they do consciously to maintain American hostility towards the vast majority of Middle East people, encourage that hostility in its ideological fantasies, hasten it towards less rather than more knowledge, sympathy, and above all, understanding. And it must be added, there has been no significant scholarly deterrent or corrective to these views in the media. Those experts and scholars who might have provided less distorted, more interesting views have either not come forward or have not been chosen by the powers that be. Some specifics are in order. As against the six cluster I mentioned, no sustained, meaningful, and undeterred exceptions to them are to be found in the pages of the following 
and here I speak of news coverage and opinion. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, the New York Review of Books, the New Republic, Commentary, Foreign Affairs, the American Scholar, Partisan Review, Policy Review, the Atlantic Monthly, Dissent, the New Criterion, Midstream, Tikkun, Moment, and the American Spectator. CBS, NBC, ABC, and PBS, in essence, work within the same paradigm. Most of the provincial papers, journals, and TV outlets depend on the mainstream majors to a large extent. As a test of my overall thesis, ask yourselves whether any of you can think of a media outlet whose guiding principles vis-a-vis -vis Middle East coverage include the notions that Islam is never to be criticized, that the PLO, while prone to a few excesses, is basically democratic and lovable, that one or another Middle East state besides Israel is worthy of unrestricted US aid, and that Christianity and Judaism are basically violent, hypocritical, and depraved religions. Of course, no such publication exists, whereas, in fact, all the ones I've mentioned give unexamined support to precisely the opposite views. And why not, you may well ask. For after all, the media can call on a substantial roster of experts who regularly represent the Middle East for the US media and US policy. Note, and here eyes must be dotted, that this roster virtually but not completely excludes Muslims and Arabs, although many are available. It includes people whose political sympathies are clearly inscribed in what they write, although, and this is the pity of it, some of the scholars persist in characterizing what they do as impartial or detached or expert. This is the point, and it raises the, to me at least, profoundly interesting question of how these scholars in the group continue to practice their art while remaining hostile or at least antithetical to and substantially reserved about its central object, the religion and culture of Islam. The roster I have in mind is responsible for what is essentially the entire gamut of media representation of the Middle East. It includes Bernard Lewis, Eli Kaduri, Walter LeCur, Ernest Gellner, Connor Cruz O'Brien, Martin Peretz, Norman Podharitz, J.B. Kelly, Daniel Pipes, I could go on. I could supply you with a list of people who either could do a better or more informed job or whose efforts to do the job have been systematically rebuffed. The US media is, I would say, much more predisposed to hearing Bernard Lewis explain the TWA hijacking by a long, abstract, and general account of Shia history until the Middle Ages than in hearing about the widespread, ongoing debate between nationalists and supporters of Islamic tendency or between various factions within the Islamic tendency itself. The media is prone to welcome, I would say it is primed for Ernest Gellner's theses that Muslims are a nuisance and viscerally anti-Semitic, that their culture and politics can be discussed in thousands of words without a single reference to people, periods, or events. Then they are in discovering whether there is a significant correlation between assertions about Islam based exclusively on classical texts on the one hand, and on the other what Muslims in various countries belonging to various classes, different genders, and differing social systems actually do. Never are polls done by Arabs and Muslims cited. Never are the old cliches that Islam is a political religion and that there's no distinction between Islam and Islamic life ever violated by history, reality, events, people, or production. Obfuscation is one thing, active insinuation quite another. Why do learned Orientalists lend their authority to a symposium on terrorism edited by the Israeli UN ambassador, if not as Orientalists, to connect Islam directly to terror? And why out of all the prodigiously complex, even painful realities in the 150 million strong Arab Islamic world and its history, do classical Orientalists find only Islam's poor knowledge of Europe and its anti-Semitism to discuss? Why are poetry, plays, novels, novellas, and essays never discussed? What has Islam become but a crudely and indiscriminately represented bogeyman certified by the Orientalists? Aside from the fact that expert scholarship of this kind, now in full view of readers of the New York Review, the Times, and Commentary, has no counterweight to oppose it, it is on its merits a disgrace to the world of intellectual production in the social sciences or humanities generally. Why is it that no prominent Africanist, Sinologist, Indologist, or Japanologist speaks in this patronizing and deflating manner? The answer to conclude is that ex scholarly expertise on the Middle East has paid a very high price for its entry into the mainstream media and the halls of policy. It has sacrificed information on what goes on in the Middle East, Israel included, almost completely. It has sacrificed understanding and compassion totally.
to order. Our next speaker is Leon Wieseltier of the New Republic, literary editor of the New Republic. For my sins as a scholar, probably, I've been forced to live among journalists for the past four or five years of my life. So it is largely about journalists that I wish to speak. I would begin my remarks by saying that it is beyond, quite, that beyond any doubt there is a disgraceful and almost systematically distorting image of Islam that is presented in the American media. More often, these distortions are about Islamic culture and religion and society than of Islamic politics, and such distinctions must be made. Sometimes these distortions are anti-Muslim, sometimes they are not. One does not have to be anti-Muslim to be anti-Qaddafi or anti-Khomeini, though I'm sure it helps. Uh, just last week, uh, more evidence of this distortion was given as Washington assumed that its conventional wisdom concerning Mr. McFarland's mission to Iran, that, there's no such, that there are no moderates in Iran, period. That it was almost a definitional matter that anyone who lived within the borders of Khomeini's Iran was crazy. Uh, about this, I have no argument. There are, however, a number of complicating and I think important points or qualifications that I would like to introduce into the discussion uh, for the purpose of arriving at two rather broad and coarsely stated conclusions. The first is that some of this almost insurmountable ignorance about the Islamic way of life is owed not to any particularly anti-Muslim prejudice, but to the almost insurmountable ignorance of the American media about everything foreign to the United States. Uh, the, in the intellectual shallowness of journalists needs no documentation by me. Uh, the system of foreign policy reporting according to which a man who has spent five years in Warsaw must land in Beirut on Tuesday and be an expert about it is well known to all of you. The lack of linguistic competence doesn't help. Uh, though in the case of a man like Thomas Friedman of the New York Times who does know and speak Arabic, it shows quite clearly what difference the language makes. Uh, the coverage of India, of China, of Africa, and the American media is just as disgracefully ignorant as the coverage of the Middle East. Uh, second point, uh, the, co the coverage of Israel, of the Jewish point of view, call it what you will, of Judaism certainly, and indeed of the American way of life, the distortions contained within that coverage in the Arab press are no less spectacular than some of the distortions that are contained in the Western press about the Islamic way of life. Are those distortions anti-Semitic? Sometimes they are, but sometimes they are not. And indeed, the interesting thing about them, to my mind, is not whether or not they are anti-Semitic, but the extent to which they point to the more common difficulties of the interpretation of one culture by another culture across vast cultural differences. Three, there is the very delicate question of stereotypes about which I have time only to speak crudely. The stereotypes are the sort of lie that succeeds precisely because there is always a grain of truth in them. And I include the anti-Semitic stereotypes of the Jew in that generalization. For example, there has emerged since the revolution, since Khomeini's revolution in Iran, the, f the famous and fabulous stereotype of the Muslim fundamentalist. Now, it seems obvious that Muslim fundamentalism is a coarse exaggeration based on ignorance of a very complicated phenomenon. It is obvious that the full intellectual, theological, cultural, political, social meanings and machineries of the Iranian revolution have not been understood in this country. And yet, the stereotype of the raving or radical Iranian Shiite fundamentalist student was a stereotype that was created by a kind of collusion between those students themselves and their leaders and the Western media. Many of the events that led to the worst American prejudices were staged for the purpose of reaching American living rooms. Four, there are biases in the coverage of Israel too. I will try to deal with them quickly and no doubt we will discuss them some more. The war in Lebanon, in my view, was a wrong war and in some ways a disastrous and disgraceful war. Uh, but the vilifications of Israel that appeared in the American press during that war were as, as, as egregious a violation of journalistic principle and intellectual honesty as I have seen. Second, on the question of the West Bank, it is the common prejudice of the American media that Israel should vacate all or most of the West Bank as soon as it can. This is a prejudice that I happen to share. It is a prejudice that I'm sure most of you happen to share, and for that reason it is a prejudice that we do not find particularly offensive, but it is nonetheless a prejudice. Three, on the matter of the coverage of the Palestinians, this is a rather complicated question. 
but one thing it seems clear to me on the basis simply of reading the American media, and that is that the notion that the Palestinian people by, by, this, by this late date, by November 86 or wherever we are, have been erased or made invisible seems to me perfectly ridiculous. Which intelligent reader of the American media does not know that the Palestinians are a stateless people, that they were occupied in 1967, that they live under occupation, that they have lived for generations in camps and shanty towns, that they are as unwelcome in the Arab world, indeed probably more unwelcome in the Arab world than in the Jewish world, that a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict probably depends upon a solution of the Palestinian problem, and so on. All this seems to me not only unknown, but to have reached the status of cliché. My final two coarse conclusions, I rather coarsely stated conclusions, I think they're rather exquisite myself. Uh, <laughs> First, I think that the time has come to consider the limitations of media criticism and criticism of the press as a primary form of political discourse for the following reasons. One, the criticism of the press by now at least has the effect merely of reproducing and intensifying the very problem of bias that it deplores. Each of us has our own favorite sinners. My friends can point to Jonathan Randall. My enemies speak of other correspondents. I'm not sure there's anything to be gained by this except the simplification of the entire field into a cast of monsters versus heroes. Second, the obsessive criticism of the media flatters the very media it denounces by attributing much too much power to it. It seems to me that despite all the biases in the coverage of the Middle East, it is still possible for an intelligent man or woman to see the story within the story. There are events that happen even if reporters fail to cover them. There are events the truth of which can be seen even if reporters miscover them. We are not all mindless puppets of the networks, of the large newspapers, of the media conglomerates. It is possible to read newspapers critically, to watch television broadcasts critically, and to evaluate critically what we have as the evidence of our own eyes. Final point, and this is the question of objectivity. Let me start this way. Objectivity may seem like an antiquated bourgeois notion serving really to disguise all kinds of political, institutional, and cultural interests. That indeed may be the case. But it seems to me that there is a basic philosophical and methodological decision that one must make. And that decision is whether or not the truth is available, whether or not there is something that may be called the truth, about which honest men and women may disagree, about which they may dispute by pointing to evidence and adducing proofs and fighting over texts and over phenomena of history that require difficult interpretation. And not even the all-invasive, all-intrusive media, in my view, have succeeded in destroying the notion of the truth of a situation. Finally, press criticism, media criticism, in the Jewish case, in the Palestinian case, and other cases, seems to me sometimes to be not just a contribution to the discussion, to intellectual discourse or political criticism, but a crutch that begins even to hobble action. If the Jewish case in the United States is heard, if the Jewish case is understood better here than in other cases, it is not because the Jews came to a country that was distinguished by any native or essential hospitality to Jews or Judaism. The anti-Semitism and the prejudice and the hostility the Jews faced in this country when they arrived were certainly as great as any anti-Muslim feeling that exists now. But what the Jews did was they organized intellectually and politically. They founded institutions such as the Anti-Defamation League, and they proceeded to see to it that their case would be heard. I think it is probably fair to say that it was a milestone in the history of Palestinian representation in this country when an organization such as the Arab Anti-Defamation League was founded, quite obviously and quite correctly on a Jewish model. The Jews knew that the world would not understand them properly. But when the Jews were in trouble, they did not wait for the world to understand them properly. They acted to save themselves. I think for vulnerable people, for minorities, the people who live in wretchedness, the important point finally, and to me this was Zionism's great lesson, is that what is really important is not that the world understand you. What is really important is that you understand yourself and that you save yourself. Thank you.
As a transplanted English radical, I come before you today with the queasy sensation of having been outdone in point of English joviality and emollience by Professor Lewis, and outpointed in matter of radical style, irony, and passion by Professor Said. I stand before you, therefore, somewhat naked, and propose to begin with what I hope will be the day's only uncontroversial remark which is that no thoughtful person, I imagine, in this audience, with any special knowledge of any subject or any area in the Middle East, will be satisfied with the way in which that subject is discussed in print, whether in the general press or in learned journals. My own small area of expertise in the matter, which is the island of Cyprus, I find vindicates this self-pitying proposition. Most coverage and discussion of it is at least three of the following things. Totally ahistorical, lacking any historical perspective, a very slight but perceptible reference towards whatever the current official or administration thinking might be, and a wistful, elusive feeling that truth lies somewhere between any two propositions that may recently have been taken on it. Concerning the Middle East, I want to argue, and specifically the conflict over Palestine, a subjectively even-handed treatment, inadequate as it is, is very often abandoned and sometimes suspended completely. Now. Any examples I might select would, ipso facto, be selective, even if I had three times ten minutes in which to speak. But the following selections, taken naturally from context, as all quotation selection is, trying to anticipate that criticism, seems to me to be emblematic rather than to be anecdotal. I have chosen them less for journalism per se than from that bloody crossroads where journalism and scholarship and we today are met. First. The book by Joan Peters called From Time Immemorial, an attempt to show that there was no such thing even as a Palestinian problem, that there was no such thing as a Palestinian people. Its reception in this country ranged from the respectful to the moist and adoring, and came from all corners of the academy and the press. It isn't so much important, and I haven't the time to stress the massive evidence that has since accumulated that the book was a mere concoction, as it is to underline the extraordinary difficulty that that evidence had in finding its way to print. Only after extensive ridicule of the book in the Israeli and English presses in particular were any mild reconsiderations published in this country, in which it was interesting to see a number of people fall on both sides at once, but too late. Second, the book The Fateful Triangle by Professor Noam Chomsky. I don't want to pay Professor Chomsky any unintentional compliments because I think he deserves far better, but it's correct to say that his book on the Lebanon War was, at the time of its publication, unrivaled. That is to say, it had no competitor. There was no other book about the engagement of the United States and its Israeli ally in the Lebanon War. And the book was published over the uniquely timely intersection of the events of that war, The Vote. Long, very dense city and highly footnoted, written by one of the few American Jews with an international scholarly reputation. What was its fate? It was unreviewed in the New York Times, it was unreviewed by the Washington Post, it was unreviewed by the Los Angeles Times, by the New Republic, by my own magazine The Nation, by Commentary, and by all the magazines on the list that even Edward, with his speed and dash of delivery, didn't have time to complete reading. A no less than scandalous, I dare to say scandalous, state of affairs. Third, Flashpoint, a public broadcasting package with three films intended for screening last April on the question of Palestine. The three, three films broke up, as such packages of three often do, into two pro-Israeli segments and one made by an anti-Zionist Jew. Public broadcasting stations in the cities of New York and Washington, D.C., among others, declined to screen the pro-Palestinian third of the capsule. The New York Times, the journal of record of the bien pensant and the only journal of record for the benighted greater New York City area, reviewed the film that was not screened and said it was, and I'm quoting, not far from the films produced by the Third Reich. Now, I work in a cynical profession and I've sent my colleagues the following puzzle. This is all you know. You have to say what the topic is. PBS film is banned from the screens of New York. The New York Times does not comment on the banning, but describes the unseen film as Nazi. My question to my colleagues is, what was the film about and what view did it take? Not even the most conservative of my friends and colleagues has failed to guess the answer without hesitation. I find this cynicism gives me very little pleasure. I find it unattractive. 
So is the knowledge that is widely disseminated and internalized in my profession that if a critic of Israel dares to make these sort of points, he will face either the repellent allegation that he is anti-Semitic if he's a Gentile, or that he is a victim of Jewish self-hatred if, as so often, he is a Jew. This latter-day version of Morgan's Fork with its blackmailing and authoritarian implications is present in the minds of every journalist that I know, and is agreed with varying degrees of resignation that wherever, whereas life is indeed unfair, the three examples I cited above could not occur so flagrantly in a debate on any other question. That if a critic of Israel dares to uh, make these sort of points, he will face either the repellent allegation that he is anti-Semitic if he's a Gentile, or that he is a victim of Jewish self-hatred if, as so often, he is a Jew. This latter-day version of Morton's Fork, with its blackmailing and authoritarian implications, is present in the mind of every journalist that I know. And it's agreed with varying degrees of resignation that whereas life is indeed unfair, the three examples I cited above could not occur so flagrantly in a debate on any other question. Let me suggest two reasons why I think this might be so, um, and I'll give you another quotation. It's uh, the following. You have to guess where it comes from. Put simply, it says, American journalists are interested only in two topics in the Middle East, Israel and the United States. Whatever takes place that is related to these countries is amplified and broadcast to the world. Whatever does not is virtually ignored. That's from the Media in the Middle East by Daniel Pipes in commentary. Uh, in the bizarre context to an argument that the entire United States press is ranged against the Israeli case. One of the unintended ironies, one of the unintended ironies which all close readers of Dr. Pipes have long learned to cherish and treasure from his pen. I would say, however, I would say that there is more than a hint of the ethnocentricity uh, of the question in that, uh, in that small extract from Dr. Pipes' work. Second, more vulgar, but less escapable. Simple racism. Where did the following appear? Description of a play at the American Repertory Theater in this town. Even less of the universalist prejudices of our culture prepared us for this play's Arab. A crazed Arab, to be sure, but crazed in the distinctive ways of his culture. <laughs> he is intoxicated by language, cannot discern between fantasy and reality abhors compromise, always blames others for his predicament, and in the end lances the painful boil of his frustrations in a pointless though momentarily gratifying act of bloodlust. That is a signed comment by the owner and editor of the New Republic. I disagree with you, Leon, I'm sorry. I don't believe that could appear about an Indian or an African in any other, in any other magazine in this country. I don't think it would be tolerated for an instant. As to whether, as to whether it should be said at all or of any ethnic or racial group in the magazine that once boasted Walter Lippmann and Edmund Wilson is a question for those who toil in that vineyard. <laughs> now, we would, be, we would be wrong and we'd be open either to the charge of self-pity or amor propre on what I think of as our side of the house if we located this problem just in the workings of the media or the academy. The two are caught, and I'll, I realize I'm going to have to save some of this for my rebuttal. The two are caught, naturally, between a state policy which favors Israel uh, for opportunistic reasons, a simple administration decision on which, which is the right horse, and a public opinion with a vulgar prejudice against the swarthier kind of Middle Easterner. The second can be seen in almost any kind of contemporary cartoon, not exempting those by the liberal bien pensant, such as Herblock of the Washington Post, where the unpardonable dual stereotype, showing Arabs and Iranians either as swollen plutocrats or as malodorous and subversive desperados, Again, exactly mirroring the fork upon which European anti-Semites used to attempt to impale the Jews. Exactly mirroring and duplicating that fork. Um, and the former is evidenced by a tone in coverage which naturally annexes Israeli terminology. To be more precise, the terminology of the Israeli right. I will, uh, I will return. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, to congratulate my panelists on being such 
punctual and obedient <laughs> servants when I rise in my <clears throat> threatening guise. <clears throat> there are uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the initial remarks. The videotaping of this session is undertaken by the Fletcher School of, of Diplomacy and is not any larger, um, it's not the pr commercial media. So you m don't expect to see your face on television uh, <laughs> this evening. Uh, what the use of this film will be, I think, is yet to be decided. Is that not correct? Possibly for uh, teaching purposes or matter of record. Now is the time for you to pass your questions to the center aisle, and they will be picked up by uh, duly appointed messengers of God. It is time now for the uh, second round, or the rebuttal, or the elaborate uh, continuation of remarks rudely interrupted by the chairman, as the case may be. <laughs> Professor Lewis. <clears throat> First, uh, a brief word on the <clears throat> remarks made by our two representatives of the media. Yes, of course, it is very easy to find examples of prejudice directed against not, I, I was going to say both, but I think one might go further and say against all parties in the Middle East. Um, this does not prove, I think, that the media as a whole are biased one way or the other, merely that the media idea of impartiality is to balance opposing prejudices. And very often it happens that way. And this is, of course, very understandable on television in particular. It makes for much better television than presenting a balanced and reasoned point of view. And we have just seen in the elections which have taken place in this country where the discussion is not of remote places and foreign peoples, but of immediate domestic issues how difficult it is, most would say impossible, to arrive at any serious or balanced discussion in the circumstances of television and to, to a lesser extent even of the other media. It is a real difficulty and we will all naturally concentrate on those passages which are offensive to us and sort of masochism of the reader which is universal. I don't think it can be assigned to any particular direction. Um, ignorance is of universal application. When I was cut off by the chairman, I was about to say one or two things about the, the duties of the scholar as I perceive them, and Professor Said very obligingly exemplified some of the points I was going to make, one way or the other. And the apple pie I was about to offer you were Shall we say truth and objectivity? These are much misunderstood words and perhaps are not appropriate at the present time. Obviously, we all have our allegiances, we all have our prejudices, we all have our opinions, and in a free society, we are all entitled to advance them. But there are ways of doing this. If for truth and objectivity we substitute honesty and fairness, I think we are talking in more practical rather than theoretical terms and enunciating something which we can all understand. Um, for example, it is hardly either honest or fair to try and refute someone else's point of view, not in terms of what he says, but of motives which you choose to attribute to him in order to make the refutation more easy. Um, it is hardly an example of truth or fairness to use the smear tactics which became well known in this country at an earlier stage by lumping together um, writers, scholars, journals of very disparate characters and origins and thereby conveying rather than asserting, and the word I think used was insinuating, um, that they are all the same, that they constitute one homogeneous, centrally directed, conspiratorial whole. Much of what was said about the media, I would agree with, but how far beyond the media shall we pursue it? I do not recall any scholar arguing that terrorism in the Middle East is congenital. I would be very surprised if any such thing could be said. Nor that terrorism is inherently Islamic. In the colloquium which was quoted, and the point which I made, and anyone who is interested can check it quite easily in the printed version, 
was that to say that terrorism is Islamic is an absurdity in the sense that Islam is a religion like other religions with an ethical and moral standard and is opposed to terrorism as such. The only way in which that expression has meaning is in the rather more political character of Islam, particularly at the present time, in that at the present moment, almost all political movements tend to acquire a political character, and terrorism is, after all, a political movement. Um, perfect objectivity is obviously not possible. But let me remind you of a saying of the economist Robert Solow, who says, Surge surgeons know that perfect asepsis is not possible, but we do not, for that reason, conduct surgery in sewers. Thank you. Professor Saeed. I um, felt that uh, in the first part of the discussion, uh, there was broad agreement. I mean, we all agree that there's distortion, that the media does X and Y and Z and so on and so forth, and that as scholars, we should be doing other things. And given the constraints of time, I, uh, I talked about a group or a, a number of both scholars, <coughs> journalists, intellectuals, and journals and uh, newspapers. But I would be perfectly happy to take the, the case, uh, the, 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 the point case by case, and to show not that they were all directed by some outside source, far from it, but that there was, I didn't even, in fact, I didn't say that. I said that there are a set of motifs that keep turning up in the media. The six that I mentioned, I'm not going to repeat but that I felt that the scholars who knew more about the Middle East, and f I still believe, and I agree, I guess, with all the co my colleagues on this panel, that it is the duty of scholars to act in the interest of truth and justice and uh, fairness and honesty and all the rest of it, I felt that their role wasn't enough of a deterrent to this essentially mischievous misrepresentation of the Middle East, and that far, in some cases, far from uh, preventing the distortions from getting greater, they were actively uh, assisting, in a sense, or participating, if you like, or collaborating within this framework uh, to make it worse. And the examples I gave um, seem to me bear it out. Where a book, for example, Professor Lewis mentions the Symposium on Terrorism, in the introduction of the book, uh, Ambassador Netanyahu says that the two essential sources today in the world of terrorism are the Islamic world, Islam, and the KGB. And then, framed by this, <coughs> by this discussion, we have only three representatives <coughs> from the scholarly discussion of the Middle East who essentially say that the, the word, uh, Professor Lewis, if I may, qu may quote him here, more or less verbatim, says it's foolish, as he said today, to say that Islam is uh, a, a religion that, pr uh, that promotes terrorism. It's a great religion like Judaism and so on and so forth. But then he goes on to say in the next paragraph that it is correct to use Islam as a designation for terrorism in the modern world. Now, I would also quarrel with the no, I mean, I think there's a context there, the context of the book, the context of public discussion in which it is left to no one's imagination that Islam produces terrorism. I mean, I think the, uh, the insinuation there is quite clear. I don't think, I don't think it's the case that, um, that in talking about uh, Islam today, we have experts trying to, shall we say, promote understanding not only of the diversity of Islam, of the Islamic world, and I speak now as a person who is uh, who, who's in, interested in learning more about it rather than less. It's not a question of promoting it up, but rather concentrating on a few simple points, that Islam is essentially political. Well, what, it, what in this context is the word political? I mean, it could mean anything, but it does seem to suggest that mostly Muslims are running about making political points and doing nothing else, you know, that they might live and produce and die and write and think and feel. It's, it reminds me of a story by Groucho Marx, one of my favorite Groucho Marx stories. He's coming down in the elevator of a hotel in Italy and a group of priests come in, come in, the, hotel, in the elevator and one of them turns to him and says, oh, Mr. Marx, you know, my mother really is an admirer of your film. So Groucho turns to him and says, hey, I didn't know you guys were allowed to have mothers. I mean, this is the impression you get, you see, so <laughs> that's number one. And the other point that needs to be made in this context is the suppression, this is the point, the suppression of information that might 
show the Middle East as a rather more complex place than, uh, than, than writings of this sort generally allow. So if you're going to talk about Islamic terrorism, what about in the same context talking about Jewish terrorism or Christian terrorism? I mean, the fact, for example, if you want to show that there's anti-Semitism in the Arab world, I'm sure there is. I mean, there's anti-Semitism everywhere. But one has to make distinctions, I would think, be between quotations from a newspaper, uh, trends, public policy, beliefs, uh, uh, char ethnic characterizations. All of these things are lumped together and produced in, in a series called anti-Semitism in the Arab world or the Arab and Islamic world. So that's one problem, the, the, the question of distortion and so on. And then the other thing, and this is the last point I want to make, is the constant protestation that what we are doing is scholarly, it's object I'm, I'm all in favor of these things. I'm all in favor of these things. But I think that we have to allow that the public is rather more, uh, rather more intelligent than that. Protestations are not enough. One has to demonstrate these things by, f indeed, by fairness, by a wide scope, by quoting the whole context, not just part of it, and to stop pretending, I think, that what we are about is only scholarship, whereas in fact we are dealing, as everyone here I'm sure knows, we are dealing with extensions of a conflict that occur, and the protection of the guild, that is to say the, the, the ritual protestation of formulae about one thing or the other, are not going to, dis, uh, are not going to dispel the truth. The truth is there, as, as Leon quite correctly said, and one can perceive it. That one point of view is essentially much more represented than another, nobody in this room would deny. So I think that's the point that has to be made over and over again. Mr. Wisseltier. I'll comment on a few of the things that were said here, and my comments may, with any luck, add up to a coherent argument. Uh, it seems to me that Edward Said has drawn a caricature, uh, that he has taken extremes of Israeli and Jewish opinion, put them together, and come up with some alleged mainstream position which characterizes the Jewish state, mainstream Jewish institutions, the American Jewish community, the American Jewish press, and the American non-Jewish media. Who, for example, or where in any of those institutions is the equation of Palestinians with Nazis made? The equation is made in many disgusting quarters of the Jewish community. It is made by many Likud front groups. It is made by a group called the Americans for a Safe Israel. It is encouraged by Sephardi demagogic politicians and by Ashkenazi demagogic politicians in Israel. But where in the mainstream Jewish community, within the Labor Party, within a much of the Likud party, within the American Jewish community, is that particular or any of the other repulsive ideas that he cited, where exactly are they to be found? I will not stick Edward Said with Abu Nidal. I would prefer not to be stuck with Mayor Kahana. Each of us have our big problems, but the fact remains that both of us are doing our best to solve these problems, and we are not alone in our communities. On the question of Jewish terrorism, one of the reasons that Jewish terrorism was written about less frequently than Palestinian terrorism is because until quite recently, that is to say, from the period of the 1930s and 40s until sometime in the late 70s, Jewish terrorism occurred less frequently than Palestinian terrorism, and that is simply the historical fact. Now, now, on the other hand, with the out on the other hand, with the outbreak of Jewish terrorism in Israel and on the West Bank, there have been many people, as Edward Said knows quite well, who have been screaming loudly and hoarsely in condemnation and denunciation and acting politically, both to bring those people to justice and to destroy not only the political and physical infrastructure that made those acts possible, but to destroy the intellectual foundation of that kind of extremism, with whom one may be permitted to disagree without being accused of being a self-loving Jew, I hope. Uh, I refer to a great many intellectuals who may disagree with Chomsky and Shachak and Izzy Stone and all kinds of people on all kinds of questions, but I, but I think who are decent people who are not racists about Arabs, Muslims, or Palestinians. With my friend Hitchens, I will not try to compete in wit, uh, nor in dishonesty. Uh, as far as the Joan Petersburg, Hitchens and I are close friends. We can say anything we want about each other. <laughs> 
The Joan Peters book was a shabby performance by an ignorant woman. Uh, the Joan Peters book should have been refuted in my magazine, in other magazines. It was not. Uh, it was not because I had not read the book before I signed it. That's why it was not. Uh, on the other hand, within the Jewish community and outside the Jewish community, the Joan Peters book had no impact whatsoever for two reasons. One, because most American Jews do not, are not terribly interested by what happens exactly inside Israel. Two, because it was a very fat book. And three, because I believe that most American Jews are no longer hospitable to the political conclusion that the Joan Peters book begs, which is that there are no such things as Palestinians. Uh, that was the upshot of that book. And my view is it may be optimistic, but I speak here from some knowledge and experience, is simply no longer the commonly held view in the Jewish community. Now, the notion that, the notion that anybody who disagrees with Israeli policy is either routinely called anti-Semitic by, I don't know who, the, the American media, the American Jewish media, the Jewishly controlled media, the notion that all such critics are routinely called anti-Semitic is simply ridiculous. There has been a very bitter debate going on inside the Jewish community ever since Israeli troops captured the West Bank in 1967. A debate at least as bitter, if not more so, as the debate that goes on between the Jewish community and the Palestinian community. More bitter, I say, in the way, because internecine debates, fraternal struggles are always more bitter. No, yes, that all of Israel's in, the, in the spirit of rebuttal and in the parliamentary tradition, I want to address direct, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. In the spirit of uh, rebuttal and in the parliamentary tradition, I want to speak directly to two points made by Professor Lewis in his second appearance at the microphone. The f first, his uh, dismissal of the idea that there is any pattern um, in the misrepresentation that Edward Said and myself have mapped and sketched as much as we dare. And second, that, uh, as you put it, there's no, there is no view that uh, the, that there's anything, con I'm sorry, I'll have to start again, that there's that there's nothing congenital. I'm having to read from my, my notes of what he said. He says, he knows of no one who says that the propensity to terrorism, that's to say, is congenital. No Sorry? No scholar. No scholar. Um, let me give uh, a, your quotation. The root cause of terrorism lies not in grievances, but in a disposition towards unbridled violence. Would that meet your criterion? <laughs> of the allegation of the allegation that there is congenit congenitality in the, in the matter. Well, that's from the introduction to Terrorism, How the West Can Win, uh, by, by Benjamin Netanyahu, who you may say is no scholar, and I would be compelled to agree with you. <laughs> He's the, um, all he is, uh, apart from being Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and a leading member of the Israeli hard right, all he is at the moment is a convener of scholars. His institute, the Jonathan Institute, is a recognized resource for a vast network of academic and uh, journalistic uh, resources, excuse me, out outlets. Uh, it's routinely quoted as a, as a source of expertise on terrorism on the news, and I think I'm being videoed by uh, the Tufts, the Fle the Tufts uh, School, Fletcher School, rather, of law and diplomacy, who produced a book, Hydra of Carnage, a depiction of terrorism that's entirely based on the findings of the Jonathan Institute. I don't mind debating with Benjamin Netanyahu, that's to say. Um, what I do mind is that when I come to the seminar, I find he's the moderator of it. Um, <laughs> I would say, mutatis mutandis, that the words um, terrorist, rejectionist, extremist, and fundamentalist have come to mean in a, over a vast swathe of discourse, what Israeli conservatives understand them to mean. And I say that that is a pattern, that it is not a mere coincidence and not something that can be laughed off. It's a signal triumph of unassimilated, undigested propaganda. And it finds its summer, as I say, in the acceptance of, of Benjamin Netanyahu, who is, uh, and, in the, and in the farming and emergence of terrorism as a discipline, a subject in its own, in its own right, with chairs and course credits,
and complete with the whole machinery of PELF that has begun to infest academe. Um, now, I think we may find certain root cause theories of terrorism to be simplistic and unpersuasive and propagandistic also. But I think that Ambassador Netanyahu's finding on page 204 of his book that, quote, the root cause of terrorism is terrorists, uh, <laughs> is open to objection on both journalistic and scholarly grounds, <laughs> as well as on aesthetic and on grammatical ones. <laughs> one, asks, <clears throat> one asks really, one really asks for no more than that. Um, the job of independent journals and, and of the academy is not to reflect bigotry in public opinion or to cater through special institutes and seminars to the pressures of raison d'etat. Uh, least of all is it to collude with uh, propagandistic and self-serving views of the world. Thank you. We now come to the uh, question period, and in the time remaining for the session, I think perhaps the best format is for me simply to stand at the podium here and read the questions as they are written on these cards before me. Some are addressed to one or, number, one or another member of the panel. Others uh, are simply general. And I will take them from the top of the pile as presented to me. The first such question, what are some ways that scholars can forward a more objective view of the Middle East? And I presume we can ask uh, either any or all of you to respond to that. We could visit it. <laughs> Speak into the microphone in front of you. The only thing I would say is that they could, they could visit it. They could visit it. Professor Lewis? By speaking and writing as scholars. Professor Saeed? By telling the truth. <laughs> And by recognizing their limitations. <laughs> the next question is addressed to Professor Saeed. Please name names one or two younger scholars on the right path. Well, I, this is, of course, uh, it, it's invidious, but I, what, I, what I wanted to say in point of fact is that uh, that there are a number, that there is a number of, of, of younger scholars, I would call them alternative scholars, if you like, who are not prominent in the way that some of the senior scholars that we've been talking about are, who take points of view that are, shall we say, more investigatory, more in inquiring, and more skeptical about some of these categories that have to do with if, even the notion of Islam itself, which is now y routinely referred to in an undifferentiated way, that do study... The question, I regret to say, is name... Yes, name. but I'm, I'm trying to get around that. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. The McCarthy theory. Yeah, just like the McCarthy. No, I, I would prefer not to name names. I mean, the names are... Shame, I know, I know. It's a... All right, Professor Lewis, do you believe there can be... Ex I think that must be expertise, though it is not stuff the way I need to expect. <laughs> I'll tell you how it's spelled. E X P E R T I E S. And I'm not sure what that should be called. Expertise? Expertise or what? Expertise outside of any ideological framework. No, of course not. Um, as I said before, we all have our loyalties and our allegiances and our opinions, our ideological, political, and other commitments. And the point that I was making is that we should deal with these in a scholarly and not in a polemical or, shall we say, in a passionate way. And. Uh, and there are enough examples of scholarship to show that this is perfectly possible. Um, no less a person than John Stuart Mill told us a long time ago that in refuting an argument, one should state it in the best form possible and as the proponents of that argument would have it, not manufacture an opposition in, in order to make it easier to refute. Yes, I, I'd like to uh, say something about that. That is to say, ideology, 
I would, uh, I, would, I would very much doubt that in most of the scholarly writing that is today before the public in some of the places I've referred to about the Middle East and about Islam in particular, I would venture to say that there is no discussion of the ideology of the person writing or the whole question of ideology, what is routinely presented as the truth about Shia Islam about the history of, 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 of the Islamic State, etc., is presented with the authority, without the skepticism of the scholar. And what you get, therefore, is an appearance of somebody who has gone beyond ideology and is stating the truth. Now, one of the problems that I was talking about, and I think Leon Wieseltier misunderstood, I wasn't saying that this is all part of some uh, uh, Jewish plot. I was simply saying that this is all part and parcel of a, of a policy in the United States. I'm talking about a foreign policy which this kind of writing simply abets. It doesn't question it. It doesn't, uh, uh, you know, cause it to turn back on itself. And we lurch from one catastrophe to another. And essentially, we get a compliant chorus of people saying, yes, they are terrorists. Yes, the Muslims are all basically political. They have no other existence that we need to care about. And you get no translations, effectively, of literary works that would complicate the picture a little bit. You get very little understanding of the historical circumstances in which things like state and church, as it were, uh, might, might, might not be in perfect correspondence throughout Islamic history. And this is the problem I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, people who don't know what they're doing. I think it's, it, what you have is a, a more or less routine postponement of the ideological question because there's no need to discuss it simply because we need an expert on Islam tell us why are Muslims terrorists. And this is reflected all up and down the media. When you appear on a, on, a, on a talk show or on a news program, you are there not to witness to some other kind of life. You are there to confirm the existence of terrorism. On, on this. Terrorism essentially defines the Islamic world today. And um, it's part of the ignorance we're discussing, of course. Mr. Lewis asked, Professor Lewis asked for an after. I just wanted to give an example which I think um, may serve to illustrate this rather interesting... What? Can you hear me now? Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to give an example which I think illustrates this rather interesting question which has been put to us on uh, expertise and ideology. Um, Monsieur Maxime Rodinson in Paris was more or less a contemporary and in an academic sense a colleague of mine with whom on virtually every issue of contemporary politics, general as well as regional, I disagree. Um, nevertheless, in our academic work, our training as scholars, the kind of research we do, the way we do it, the books we read, and also the books and articles we write, um, we are doing substantially the same thing. We send each other off prints, read each other with respect, comment appropriately. Now, you may choose one or the other and say, I agree with this, I disagree with that, on political grounds. That is a perfectly legitimate choice. But to use our political differences as a way of saying one is good scholarship, the other is bad scholarship, is an obvious absurdity, which Rodinson himself, by the way, characterized as Zdanovism. Uh, the next question is addressed to Professor Saeed. You have complained of the bias of such media as the New York Times, but we, we keep seeing you in person on television. And it was you who was asked to review Professor Lewis's book in the New York Times. Well, I suppose I'm the, I'm the exception who proves the rule. I, what, what else is there to say? Um, I, I, I will right. say, I will say since, since, since yes, I, I said I'm the, I suppose I'm the exception. I'm the token who, that proves the rule. Um, but I, I will say something about, since the New York Times is brought up, I, I mean, I think this is a perfect example of the, of the kind of, um, the kind of slant, if you like, uh, that I'm discussing is, for example, on one of the anniversaries of the massacres of Sabra and Shatila, uh, it wa well, Leon was asked to write an editorial, as were two other um, uh, Jewish intellectuals, I believe, at the time. Uh, it was never thought proper, either after the massacres in Sabra and Shatila or on the various anniversaries of those, to solicit the opinion, or you like, if you like, or the, the testimonial of an Arab or Palestinian. 
Um, I remember the Washington Post did the same thing, immediately going out and getting the opinion of 30 Jewish leaders in the United States. Similarly, the New York Times, 35 Jewish leaders were quoted, their response, their, their reaction to the Sabra and Shatila massacres. Not a single Arab was, 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 was asked for his or her opinion. I mean, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. And uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if people, uh, I mean, if this, if this pattern persists, as it is evident it will for the time being, um, it's, it's really part of a policy decision that, that, in my opinion, locates the essential interest of the United States in the Middle East inside Israel. I mean, so that from when you get long soul-searching pieces precisely by the very Thomas Friedman that, uh, that was referred to earlier, it is essentially the state of Israel's soul that is presented. I have not seen ever in the New York Times magazine a 10,000-word spread on the state of the Arab soul, written by an Arab, let's say. Can I? Yes. I think that Edward's point about the New York Times is self-evidently correct. The one thing I, the one thing I would point out, I mean, I don't, without seeming too self-serving, the piece that the Times asked me to write was not on the anniversary of Sabra and Shatila. It was in the wake of Sharon. the verdict against Sharon. And the piece that I wrote was a piece that made the point that despite the verdict against Sharon, Times' journalistic duplicity should not be allowed to obscure the more significant crimes committed by General Sharon during the war, uh, and that he should not be allowed to hide either his own deeds or his own ideology behind the, the kind of petty justification that Time Magazine inadvertently provided him with. Uh, and I, don't, I think that that is germane to, to the question here. I mean, sometimes, I guess where Edward and I would differ is that I can't, I mean, sometimes he reminds me there's an old, I mean, there's a Jewish joke, if you'll forgive me doing this, about two Jews walking down Broadway and they turn around and they see two very big thuggish looking people walking behind them and one Jew turns to the other and said, we better get out of it, we better get out of here, there are two of them and we're alone. Uh, <laughs> and every, every, every <laughs> um, the point that I wish to make is simply again that, that again, Edward's own writings co compare the impact of Edward's own writings, for example, with the impact of Joan Peters' writing. Uh, now, that is not to say that there does not exist, a, a, worse than an intellectual vacuum, that there do not exist powerful institutional pressures militating against the dissemination of certain ideas in this culture. That is obviously the case. The only point I wish to make is that the, the intellectual situation of the Palestinian at this point is not nearly as, as bad as it, well, I mean, not remotely as bad as it used to be, and indeed that the Palestinian, can, that, that in, at the level of intellectual life, I have made as close a study as I could of the various books, reports, pamphlets, commission reports, journalistic reports. Uh, I have seen, I have gone over tapes of television reports of that war. Uh, and I have concluded that the cost of the war in human lives was not nearly as high as it was reported to be. Now, I am an opponent of that war. Uh, I was an opponent of that war, and I remain an opponent of that war. And I say that not to credentialize myself, but merely to point out that the numbers matter. And it is, now I may be wrong, Again, there are worse things in life than being wrong. I may be wrong. There may be new evidence that comes to light. There may be evidence I have not seen. But by my own lights, based on the evidence that I have studied, it is quite clear to me that Israel was, in the course of that war, <coughs> excessively vilified, shall we say, uh, or, or opposed more than necessary. Well, I'm sorry, Leon. I'm, I'm glad to know that you oppose the war now. But uh, at the time, uh, you wrote a review that, that you, you oppose the war now. But at the time, uh, in 1983, you wrote a review of Zev Schiff's book on the Lebanon War in the New Republic, in which you said that you thought it was a worthwhile campaign to destroy the PLO. And then you went on to say that those of us who were for peace for Galilee supported peace for Galilee, the campaign, which I take it is a synonym of supporting the war. Now, if you've come to the conclusion now, which I'm glad you have, that you opposed the war, uh, you certainly didn't at the time. 
I mean, at least from judging from the evidence of the article, which I, in fact, have with me. <laughs> now, <clears throat> as, to the, as to the question of the figures on the war, uh, yes, I mean, I, I, wish, I wish you'd reply, because as to the question of the damage, of what, what was done in the war, now, that's a very tricky and complicated question, and I don't want to get into body counts and, and all the other stuff with which of course, uh, the New Republic uh, led, the, uh, led the whole group. But, for example, it was never, to my knowledge, reported in the American press, which you, you've characterized, it was never reported in the American press that Robert Fisk reported it and several other of the British correspondents uh, reported that by the beginning of September at the Israeli, pre uh, the Israeli military command headquarters in Babda, they had posted a figure of 12,000 dead during the war. Now, I recall the American press throughout was saying, partly due to the, the influence of the New Republic and other magazines, that there was very little loss of life in Lebanon and all the figures were exaggerated and so on and so forth. Um, I think that the, what you characterize as the anti-Semitic slant in the papers was on the part of most uh, reporters and commentators in this, in this country, their surprise and shock that a state that they had once thought was uh, limited in its, in, its, in its military exploits to a kind of purity of arms and so on could devastate a country as in fact it had. And to the, the final point to be made here is that ever since the Lebanese war, that is to say the invasion of Lebanon proper in 1982, there has been a systematic campaign in the United States media to efface all traces of the war but, uh, from memory. So that now we have uh, the case of a, of, of a country that was uh, always like this, or that uh, you know the Lebanon was destroyed well before the war, etc., etc. The reconstitution of without the Lebanese war. I don't have that article here. To the best of my recollection, what I wrote was that a military campaign to destroy the PLO's military structure in southern Lebanon and bring peace to Galilee was something that I. That Sharon, can I finish, please? Uh, that Sharon's designs for a kind of regional imperialist structure based upon collaboration with the Falangists in Lebanon, the notion that Lebanon would be freed and reconstituted, uh, and so on, were dangerous and immoral, and were dangerous and immoral. It was a point that I made at the time of the war, uh, and it was a point that I continued to make. I'm sorry, I, I, I want to ask you whether this is what you said. On December the 10th, 1984, you said. <laughs> December the 10th, 1984. Now, I, I want to say, in fairness, that of course, I, I honor uh, Leon's subsequent uh, uh, condemnation of the war. I mean, that's perfectly all right. But the time, December the 10th, in the New Republic, let Lebanon be Lebanon. But if you believe that, then you believe in the tooth fairy. I wonder if we can pass on, since I feel we got uh, getting down to specific uh, past history and if we were asked to be specific. Debate. I know, I know. It's it's uh, perhaps not it's the point. tone and level mm -hmm. that we're supposed to aspire to. My next question is addressed to Professor Lewis. Is it not true that promotion of U.S. national interests in the Middle East, and especially the undermining of Soviet adventurism and Islamic fundamentalism, requires direct and public recognition of and negotiation with those whom the Palestinians regard as their legitimate representatives? I think this is entirely outside the purview of our present. I say this, this is a very important and a rather complex question. Uh, the question itself has put is complex. There is no simple and easy way of answering this by a yes or no. Could, could you repeat the question again? I'm sorry, it's Mr. It's very, very it really means should the United States not negotiate with the PLO? I think I, I paraphrase the meaning of the question correctly. May I say something? You may. I was one of those people who read Professor Lewis in 1976 in January in a long article on, in Commentary magazine entitled The Palestinians and the PLO. Uh, it was a complex article. It was an article that surveyed the history of, uh, of, of the conflict in which opinions were advanced. Now, of course, 1976 is several years, it's 10 years ago. Uh, 
and his opinions may have changed, but essentially he said that, uh, that there were three possible people, three possible bodies that could represent the Palestinians. The PLO was one of them, the Jordanians were, were, were another group, uh, and the, the people on the West Bank and Gaza. Now, I think given that fact, we have a great number of indices in polls, the Al Fajr poll, which was taken a few weeks ago, uh, and elsewhere throughout the world, uh, the, where Palestinians live, suggest that, the, that, that all Palestinians, almost without exceptions, 90% of them, are, uh, feel that they should be represented by the PLO. Now, if these are the representatives of the Palestinians chosen to the best of their ability by the Palestinians, I wonder what keeps one from saying, yes, I think we should negotiate with the PLO. I mean, I don't see what the difficulty is there. <laughs> Uh, the article, by the way, appeared in 1975, not in 1976, so that is not important. Yes, I said then that there were these three possibilities. I think that, broadly speaking, at the present time, as a theoretical formulation, these three possibilities remain, with the difference that the piano is no longer now, as it was then, uh, a single and more or less unified organization. This has made the problem more complex not less complex. When one uses such words as represent, one has to understand what one is saying. Representation, as we understand the word nowadays, means some process of election and choice. Um, for a variety of reasons which are quite obvious, this has not happened. Representation is not determined by polls or newspaper articles, important as these may be. Uh, it may well be that it will be that, it, that it, the right choice politically, as the questioner puts it, in the interests of the United States. I don't know that that would be the paramount consideration. Um, would be to negotiate with a PLO, whichever it might be. But as I said before, this is not a simple question. It does not admit of a simple answer. Mr. Hitchens, um, but it does admit of a, a simple comment, which is that the United States does not refuse to negotiate with Palestine, the liberation organization. It refuses to recognize its existence. I had the opportunity to question Vice President Bush at a press conference in Jerusalem during the summer, which I took to be the inaugural press conference of his bid for the presidency of the United States. And I asked him why it was that the United States lays upon itself the ordinance that no employee of the United States government may meet even socially with anyone identified as a member or supporter of the Palestine Liberation Organization. That is the ordinance the United States, alone of all countries, has laid upon itself. And he said, because the PLO doesn't recognize the state of Israel and doesn't renounce the use of force against it. And I said, and I believe correctly, that that would be a case for breaking relations with Saudi Arabia. And I was pleased by his failure to answer my question. <laughs> but I wonder if anyone will say that there is no connection between the state policy of the United States administration, which is that the PLO does not exist, cannot be recognized, has no right to exist, if you will, and the way that that uh, organization is reflected in the media. I think it would be very hard to make a case that dissociated those two countries. Do you wish to say something? Correction. Yes, I cannot speak for the government of the United States, I have to say. However, the position has been stated repeatedly and clearly. The United States is willing to recognize and negotiate with the PLO, provided that the PLO recognizes resolutions 242 and 338. May we pass on? I regret to say that some of these questions are quite barred, but the, the order is what the order is. Professor <coughs> Saeed, could you respond to the suggestion that actions in the Middle East, such as host hostage taking, contribute to the stereotypes? Undoubtedly they do. I'm, uh, I, I mean, uh, to express my opinion on hostage taking is to say that I totally oppose it. I think it's a barbarous and stupid uh, act, totally without, uh, without, uh, without any fruitful or, or, or useful consequence. But what I would say is that, um, that as a characterization of the media, uh, it's been the case that the hostage taking that we hear so much about is so um, is so blown up, is so uh, dramatically inflated uh, on the television screen and in the, in the pages of commentary. Uh, I don't mean magazine, I mean com commentating, commenting and opinion in the national press. That it simply is, is, is pushes out 
uh, all the numerous horrors that take place elsewhere in the Middle East. But, and I wouldn't say only in, uh, only in Israel, also in the Arab world. Um, but certainly it is the case that if we, if we think about hostage taking, uh, that, that the focus on hostage taking uh, has crowded out uh, a more detailed discussion of what occurred on the West Bank uh, in, and in South London and other places where there is military occupation and or there's military intervention of one sort or another. That's the problem. Uh, and I think that the, what you have is a kind of media drum beating, which is, uh, I would thought, um, advocacy rather than, uh, rather than uh, coverage or, or reporting in spectacular way. <coughs> Uh, time is running long, and perhaps, uh, shall we have two more questions? And if the, any of you care sort of a wind-up, I'll try to allow you a final word. Two more questions. Would any of the panelists care to comment upon the poorly known stories of alleged Zionist harassment or repression of U.S. academics? Any of us care to comment on the uh, harassment of uh, of academics by uh, by Zionist organizations? I mean, I think what is referred to is the APAC blacklist and the ADL blacklist, and I'm sure there are a couple of others that where academics uh, and non-academics, but uh, many academics have been uh, have been put into a kind of rogues gallery where portraits of them are uh, written portraits of them are circulated amongst uh, organizations on the campus. Now, I regret to say that uh, there's been, to my mind, not sufficient, uh, not a sufficient number of, and loud enough disclaimers by academics uh, who dislike the practice. Uh, I've taken it that the silence on this point is maybe that, uh, that, there is, uh, that there's some approval for it. Uh, now, Misa, I believe, has taken a position on this, but, uh, but I wish individual uh, scholars here and elsewhere who believe in the civilities of discussion and politeness and exchange of scholarly amenities and so on, uh, uh, for the record, tell us what they think of such things. Uh, can I go on to the last of our questions? This is addressed to the press. I, if you wish to, sure. Yes. Um, yes, of course, all of us who are concerned for scholarly independence disapprove of this, just as we disapprove of even more pernicious publications emanating from opposing quarters. I have examples if anyone wishes to see them. Final question. Are there any significant new United States movements, cultural or political, taking place at a popular level via the, the Middle East? I don't know what that really means. Any significant popular, you want to go on to the next question? All right. For those of us who do speak in favor of the Arab world, how can we keep from being interpreted as anti-Semitic? It's very easy by not being yes, anti-Semitic. <laughs> no one wants to respond? Is it really the last question? Because I wonder who's been sorting this card. Well, the cards are in the order they came to me in. And it is a chaotic order. I quite agree. That really seems to be a waste of questions. All right. Well, the next one, I think, is even more of a waste. So I'll just arbitrarily turn it down, <laughs> if, you, if you excuse me. Uh, don't you think that, this is for Professor Say, don't you think the presentation of women in the Middle East rates a place in your categories? Yeah. <laughs> now there is a brisk answer. <laughs> and on that crisp and decisive note, with the questioning, then I'd ask each of the panelists if they have one last word they would like to put before the audience before I declare the meeting adjourned. Professor Lewis says no. Professor Said? Mr. Esatir? Just for uh, the uh, sake of saying the one thing that I wished I'd said in my opening. If, if there's one amendment, I think, to coverage and discussion that I could make or legis excuse me, make, I think it would be this, if I could legislate for it, it would be that people no more refer to the term the Arabs than they would to the Jews in discussion of this matter. Yet it's quite routine, quite routine, and quite expected that this will be the case uh, in much scholarly and almost all journalistic discussion. And I think if, if that one amendment could be made, a great number of other clarifications would naturally follow. Because I think that the, the simple use of the generic mass term, the Arabs, is, the, is at the heart of the heartless.
uh, perception that, the, that to a Palestinian it doesn't really matter that his home is Palestine. There are many other places he can go. They're all Arabs after all. Thus, in just this one element of discourse, I believe we could all make a great reform, and I appeal to people to consider it. Thank you.